All right. Good evening, everybody. We'll call to order our uh, meeting for the City Council uh, closed session for September 17th, 2024. It's now 5.32. Uh, do we have any public comment at this time? Doesn't look like we have any public comments. So with that in mind, I will close the meeting and we'll go into closed session. Good evening, welcome to the Rec City Council meeting for September 17th, 2024. It is now uh, 6.32. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Okay. I just want to remind everybody in the audience and then um, the council to silence their cell phones at this time. Okay, we did have closed session um, meeting this evening and there's no reportable action to report at this time. Okay, so special presentations and our announcements this time this uh, slot is for information presentation appointments and awards to be be presented by the city council or to the city council. This is a fire hall presentation this evening uh, from our city manager, Mr. Ledbetter. Good evening. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor Wairika City Council. I am Jason Ledbetter, your city manager. So I am going to give you really like a 10 minute a presentation uh, about what's going on with the fire department. Most of it is just a recap. And we have obviously myself and the fire chief, if you have questions, but this is just kind of uh, preliminary to the October 1st meeting. We are going to have an agendized item where we go in depth into everything that we've talked about with the fire department, the fire halls, possibility of paid staff. Uh, and at that time, it probably makes more sense, but I wanted to make sure I maximize the opportunity. And to be honest with you, Chief Lemos uh, had an elk tag and I didn't expect him back. So he uh, he was successful in his uh, uh, adventure. So I just wanted to get something on here to make sure that we continue to talk about this. So if you can move on to the next slide, Cindy. So these are slide shows that you've seen before this graph. We've posted this graph multiple times over uh online to share with the community and ultimately what are we seeing here we're seeing that the little orange that's fire calls we're seeing the blue is pretty much everything else but primarily medical calls and so something that through my research over time here that i find to be fascinating when people talk about the history and they they romanticize the past 911 as an option in the state of california was not completed until 1986, meaning at some point in most people's lifetime in this room, it was not an option to call 911. And so if we think about that and we think about this trend, it's highly unlikely that the calls are going to decrease in volume. We can assume that the calls are going to increase in volume over time because they have ever since 911 was created. And so ultimately, even fire increases, in my opinion, or fire uh, calls are increasing, as you can see uh, how large they are for that bar graph. So ultimately, the year starts in 1990, goes to 2022. This is showing you the increase in call volume, but specifically calling out medical calls. Next slide. So pretty self-explanatory graph. This is starting in 1990, and it's showing you what transpired when those calls were increasing. We were losing volunteers. So this is a pretty easy graph to read. Same time frame, 90 to 2002. And you can just kind of see the volunteer volume slowly uh, degrading. Next slide. And so this is a really cool slide because this shows you the calls per volunteer and in a perfect world, if you were to start today, you came down and you talked to Chief Lima, said, I wanna be a volunteer. We would assume that if everybody were equal, you would take on a hundred calls annually a year because that's what we need each volunteer to do. But the reality of what our uh, call volume and response looks like per volunteers is substantially different. So next slide. 
the numbers on the bottom of this graph represent people. So number one is a person, you know, number 23 is a person. And then on the left side, that bar going up, that's the volume. So number one, that person in 2022 responded to 1,100 calls. That's insanity. That's crazy. That's a crazy level of response. We have Tim Pope in the audience, and I can tell you, I believe he would validate that. Nobody has ever responded that much before. And we have some other folks right behind that person. So extremely busy for people. That's burnout, generally speaking. And Wairika Fire Department's kind of known for that within the areas that people come on, they go hard, and then they get burned out. This is just excessive. You're not making a salary. You're making $12.50 per call when you show up. Next slide. So ultimately, this slide is just showcasing to you that the training requirements technically to be a volunteer firefighter you need 600 hours worth of training uh, in order to get to the point that you technically are ready to go uh, do everything at the fire department. So this is a very difficult expectation because ultimately over time, in 1990, I would only imagine that the requirements were probably next to nothing compared to where they are now. So you have uh, a barrier to get more volunteers. So we can expect that the volunteer level will probably stay stagnant as well or continue to decrease because of these added daily pressures, the cost of living, the fact that two people are now working instead of one person in the house. Some of these people are working two jobs. It's a lot more difficult to expect someone to volunteer at the same level that they were in the past. Next slide. And then sometimes we would get some people stating that, oh, it's only because you're responding to homeless. And that's just adamantly not true. So this map represents, this heat map represents basically in blue where the medical calls are coming from. And they're spread out amongst the residential areas as you would just anticipate. So it's all of us. We're all utilizing this service. It doesn't matter your age. Inevitably, you're calling 911 just as a member of any community would. So next slide. So then just wanting to talk about the station, you know, I think people saw we sent out a newsletter recently in the utility bill that's uh, four pages, all comes from Chief Lemo. So there's great pictures in there of a cistern. We've had multiple problems at Lay Station, two sinkholes in recent history, one from a mine shaft, we believe, or a vent of a mine shaft, a broken water main. Uh, there's no exhaust capture in this uh, space for the apparatus. So what you see kind of building up on the walls, that's not a good thing. Uh, and then there's just a number of improvements that need to take place because ultimately on your Oregon side of the street, you know, closest or the east side of the building, that's the oldest side. So we're talking 20s, 30s, then 50s, 60s in the middle. And then the museum piece was later on in the 2000s, I believe. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so ultimately, as you know, we uh, sat a, f a fire ad hoc committee. And we did this because when I came on here about 31, 32 months ago, uh, it was just common knowledge that all of these issues existed, but we never discussed them in public. We never brought them to the city council. And so what we wanted to do was kind of understand them better. And so we spent over a year having multiple meetings at the community center, Mr. Keg and Mr. McCoy were both representatives from the city council, and then obviously Chief Lemos and a number of volunteers, and then we had people from the community and fire. So South Wairica, Montague Fire, Cal Fire, just depending on what we were discussing. Uh, OES would be there in some instances as well, because we wanted to really flesh out what is the issue, what are we actually solving. Uh, we had one meeting where we had a ton of Fairchild Hospital staff, Madrone Hospice staff, to try to get those recurring people that may need a higher level of care and are calling for the same slip and fall consistently, and maybe we can transition them with uh, public health or behavioral health. Next slide. So from the ad hoc meeting, three things came to pass. Uh, across the board, everybody said, you need paid staff. Your solution is paid staff. And you need that for all, all fire response, but you need it for medical response uh, primarily as your increase, right? You need a new fire hall. That was the second thing. It was obvious at that point, 
coming on, the city council had already determined we needed a new fire hall because they started us on the planning grant from CDBG to go out and analyze the cost of building a new fire hall. So that's where we're currently at with NMR. We have spent the majority of that grant funding to get to where you'll see at the end of this uh, slideshow what those renderings currently look like for a new fire hall. And then unfortunately, the easiest thing to do is there's so much money with OES and FEMA for hazard mitigation. And so there's grant funding for that. The top two items are a lot more difficult to find grant funding for. You can get paid staff, but it steps down. <laughs> It's 100% paid for year one, 50% year two, 0% year three. So it's really unprofessional. There's no planning if you just go out and get a grant to hire somebody if you have no true plan to how you're going to fund that position. Same with the fire hall. They're just not money available. There's sometimes money to supplant. Maybe you can get a million dollars. But people will send me grants. They're federal grants where there's only a million dollars available to everybody. And so you're not going to build a $20 million fire hall if there's thousands of other cities vying for that funding ultimately. So maybe that'll change in the future, but right now the money's in hazard mitigation. And so we got two grants, two different million dollar grants, one from OES at the state where we hired Sarah Chaffee. She's currently working on the hazard mitigation plan, but she will, she'll also manage the other grant that we received, which was for the air curtain burner. And I've been notified that we did pass the notification with the Air Board and that we are able to start here, I believe, that project soon. So we're going to be taking for free yard waste from the community and we're going to burn it for you. And so we're going to trial that um, and ultimately thereby mitigating the need to burn on your own site over time and thereby making the town safer. And also, let's face it. You're getting charged the same amount of money to throw that away at the dump as you are for regular garbage, and that's just ridiculous, quite frankly. Next slide. So, Retta Hogan, the assist, the old assistant city manager that retired recently and was our uh, finance director for so long, she was really good. What's the problem statement on anything we did? What's the problem statement? Because without a problem, we have no solution. So we need to be on the same page with what the problem is. And so this is what we kind of came up with uh, uh, about a year ago. Emergency calls have increased by a factor of 15. Medical call make up 80% of YFD response. Since 1990, calls for service have increased from just over 100 to over 2,000. And since 1990, volunteers have decreased from over 41 to below 22. Next slide. So we went and we we searched for ideal solutions. What's the ideal solution based off of NFPA standard, a federal recognized kind of standard for fire protection? What is it that they say we need if we're going to staff a fire, a true staffed fire department? This is the organizational chart that that they basically would say you need to meet this in order to have a truly staffed fire department. And I want you to look on the right where we have paramedics and EMS response and EMT that's circled. You'll remember this slide from before. Uh, and on to the next slide. So up in the top left, it's circled up there again. None of those are actually in the costing that we did because we started to do the costing and we quickly realized we could stop because we're not going to have $4.6 million to staff this. It's just not going to happen. So ultimately, the organizational chart that you just saw, that's a $4.6 million annual salary cost. There's no way we're going to do that. It does not even include the EMTs. So we have to be realistic on what our actual solution looks like. Next slide. We also started with the ideal fire hall. This is a 30,000, uh, I think, square foot build right here. And we were told that we had $1,000 per square foot. Well, that's a $30 million build out with no change orders. So right off the bat, we knew we can't afford both of these things. These are too much to expect from the community that they're going to stand up a fire hall of 30,000 uh, 30, square feet at $30 million. Next slide. We did take that information and we went to bond council. We have bond council, Cameron Wiest, and we said, hey, what's the ideal situation here for debt servicing a loan to build a new fire hall? And they said USDA 40-year loan at the 3.875. And we're not guaranteed to get that, but that is our best option. 
So if we had funding available and we went down this path, we have a meeting uh, with the finance director and Cameron Wiest to talk about connecting with USDA here soon in October uh, to just start fleshing out the possibility of what a loan would look like. You can see here, if you took a loan out for $15 million, well, you'd end up paying a total of $20 million, $29 million back, but you would have an annual fee of just under $750,000. So that seems like something that the city hypothetically could take on at some point with funding coming in. And then the, uh, pardon me, the other option is a $23 million build out. And that has a fee of just under $1.2 million annually. So we believe that somewhere in the midst of both of these numbers is hypothetically the future fire hall uh, for the city of Wairika. This is the ideal loan. If we have to go out to market, it's going to be a 30-year loan. And it's going to have a number of different interest rates that then other people are bidding on giving us in any particular year. But we can anticipate that those fees will be higher than these fees because there's 10 less years on the term of the loan. Uh, next slide. So this is the slide that just kind of showed, well, what are your options for bringing in more funding? Uh, obviously, a property assessment, sales tax, insurance recovery billing, safer grants, or redistribute your current general fund budget. Next slide. So we went back to our architect with uh, the fire chief and uh, some of the folks he has working with him on this design. And we said, this is too big. We need you to whittle it down. So this is the whittled down version that would still, we believe, meet our standard and our standard for future growth and future growth of the department as a whole. And so we have four bays here. We have all of these different uh, items are listed, but this is a seven, just over 17,000 square feet. And so we're looking more at closer to a $17 million build out. Next slide. These are the renderings from that design. And so ultimately, this is currently what they're speculating that they could deliver for us. Now they still need to continue to engineer these plans. Obviously, we're just at the beginning phases. Uh, but based off the information, based off of that last cartoon, uh, this is what the front of a new fire hall, hypothetically, if we went continued down this path for $17 million, this is kind of the front of that. And we have some more renderings. We'll just go to the next slide. So just under 18,000 square feet, uh, four apparatus bays. This is pared down from that 30,000 square feet. Uh, still meets the long-term term needs for the city of Wairika. Next slide. So you can kind of see the overhead map here uh, and then the back view of this location of the bays. Next slide. And just go until you get to that org chart, if you don't mind, Cindy. So then looking at trying to solve the problem of staffing, you know, we kind of went through the process of talking to Anderson, California, and Anderson has a very similar org chart, except they have three paid staff members on at all times. This organizational chart would add six brand new paid staff members, and you would see them as currently we have them listed as fire captain or fire engineer. And so they would work in this model of 4896, two days on, four days off. So all three of these teams of two would have the same schedule, essentially, because nobody would always have to work Saturday, Sunday. It would be you work Saturday, Sunday, then you work Friday, Saturday, then you work Thursday, Friday, then you work Wednesday, Thursday, then you work Tuesday, Wednesday, then you work Monday, Tuesday. Uh, so we believe this gives us 24-hour coverage. Then we would utilize our volunteers or we would go to another model that we're looking at where we may try to do what they're doing in Anderson. We're still fleshing this out with the reserve program uh, where they actually pay people to be on call. And that also alleviates kind of getting woken up at three in the morning because people are expecting it. They're getting compensated. They're waiting for that phone call. And so that's the other thing that we solve here is that we have 24 hour coverage with two people, thereby limiting the need to make that phone call for a volunteer to show up at 3 a.m. to go respond to a medical call. Do we have another slide on here? 
So ultimately, the paid staff section here is, we think, roughly $900,000. We take out the current salary. That's not the current salary of the fire chief. That's the these are worst case scenario numbers. We always want to kind of budget for the worst case scenario of compensation. So we're already compensating the fire chief out of the general fund. So we're going to remove that. We're saying the assistant chief position uh, that was underneath the fire chief that we believe we could fund that in possibly three to five years uh, if we do get funding coming in. And then ultimately you have three fire captains, three engineers locally on a very competitive salary in our opinion, but the state average were substantially underneath that. So you have, you have to just kind of understand that as with every other position up here in Siskiyou County, when you reflect us on the rest of the state of California, we're definitely, our salaries are much lower, but we want to be competitive with every other outfit up here. And we think that we could be very competitive uh, with this staffing model as it currently stands. So that's the information I have. Was that the last slide, Cindy? So I'm here. If you have questions, there will be a more thorough, in-depth analysis with more slides at the October 1st meeting. It will be a part of the normal agenda uh, with myself and Chief Lemos. But if you have questions right now, certainly have no problem answering them. And obviously, Chief Lemos is available as well. But just wanted to fill the start of this meeting to remind everybody what we've been working on when it comes to the fire department so that we don't lose touch with that. Uh, but ultimately, a much bigger presentation on October 1st is coming. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. Any questions from Council? Councilman Davis? What, what seems to be the main cause of these fires that the fire department is uh, called upon? House fires, grass fires? That's a great question that I will have to defer to uh, Chief Lemos on, if you don't mind coming up, Chief. No, no problem. <laughs> Good evening. So, uh, Councilman Davis, um, to answer your question, um, there are small percentage of structure fires. I mean, we, we respond to other uh, locations as besides Warica, we have agreements with Montague, South Warica. So, you know, they there is a smaller percentage of um, structure fires as opposed to uh, wildland or vegetation fires. But we, in in general, we refer to all of those just as you know fire calls themselves because they, you know, you need a a larger response as far as personnel for those. So, it's it's not a huge number, but I can get that for you for the for the next meeting that we have in October and get nail it down we have that available through our computer program but i off the top of my head i couldn't tell you what what percentage that is it's it's relatively small compared to the medicals thank you you're welcome you. any other council members questions comments no all right anybody from the audience have a question No, and we'll be doing, you said October 1st, correct? A bigger presentation? Okay. So hopefully a lot of people will attend the October 1st meeting that will have a lot more information to come. All right. <clears throat> so six, this is public comments. Public participation is welcomed and invited at all city council meetings. This time is set aside for residents to address the city council and all matters listed on the consent agenda as well as other items not included on the regular agenda. If your comments concern an item noted on the regular agenda, please address the council when that item is open for public comment. The city requests that persons addressing the city council refrain from making personal, slanderous, profane, or disruptive remarks. Council members when recognized by the mayor may ask clarifying questions of the presenter, but no action may be taken by the city council during the public comment section of the meeting. Under the Brown Act, the city council is prohibited from discussing or taking action on any item not listed on the posted agenda. This time is set aside for residents to address the city council on matters listed on the consent agenda, as well as other items not included on the agenda. If item is concerned, an item listed under the public hearing or new business sections of the agenda, please address the city council when that item is open for a public comment. 
please speak into the microphone from the podium. The podium electronically adjusts up and down to accommodate the speaker. Please state your name for the record prior to providing your comments. Please address the council as a whole. If you have documents to present, please provide a minimum of seven copies. These become public record. Please limit your remarks to five minutes. Since council is unable to take action on issues not on the agenda, your matter may be referred to staff for follow-up or be placed on a future agenda. The public comment period is not intended to be a question and answer period or conversations with council or city staff. Any public comment at this time? <clears throat> Summary Autry. Um, I have asked many times for people, someone to do something about the Shop Smart building. It is attractive nuisance. There was three children who crawled up the telephone pole, jumped onto it, and ran around having a field day. I had to call the police and thank God that they responded and they called their parents and had their parents come. But those three small children could very well have fallen off and killed themselves. That building needs to go. It is abandoned. It is, it needs to be removed, really. Um, and then also the bridge on the Greenway, it is broken. We have asked many times for it to be repaired. The homeless and other bike bicyclists riding that can very well sue this city for millions of dollars. They are crashing at an alarming rate going to the hospital. We need that fixed ASAP. There's also weeds that are growing up from the entrance when you pull into the Greenway parking lot. When you pull out, the weeds are so high that they're blocking the bike lane. And also, you can't see if uh, vehicles are coming. I put it on C-click fix, fix, and it was removed, but not done anything about please do something about it because I almost got hit and it's, it wouldn't be fun if I did. Thank you. Yep. Oh. Anybody else for public comment? Okay, I'll close public comment. Item seven, consent agenda. All matters listed under consent agenda are considered routine and non-controversial and will be enacted by one motion unless any member of the council wishes to remove an item for discussion. A, approval ratification of payments issued from August 11, 2024 through September 7th, 2024. Approval of minutes of the regular agenda held August 20th, 2024. Adoption, C, adoption of resolution 2024-40, approving the sale of surplus property through Gov Deals Government Surplus. The recommend City Council action before you is the motion to adopt the consent agenda of the City Council of the City of Eureka as presented. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. I'll make the motion to approve adopt the consent agenda um, for the city of Wairika as presented. I have the motion to adopt uh, by Councilman Baker. And a second from Councilman Cake. I'll second it now oh. my microphone's on. Okay. <laughs> second from Councilman Cake. I'll do roll call. Councilman Cake? Aye. Councilman Davis? Aye. Councilman Baker? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. And I'm sorry, I forgot to, as everybody can see, I forgot to mention at the start of the meeting that um, Councilman Pro Tim McCoy is absent tonight and will not be here for the meeting. All right. No old business. So number nine, this is public hearings. So looks like we do have the public hearing for tonight. Uh, this is a public hearing protocol. Mayor will describe the purpose of the public hearing. Staff will provide the staff report. 
City staff will respond to questions from the City Council. Mayor will open the public hearing. Public wanting to comment will come to the podium, provide the City Clerk with their name and address and provide their comments. The Mayor will close the public hearing. City Council will deliberate and act on the, uh, on the item. So this is presented tonight from our Community <clears throat> Development Director, Ms. Lucchese. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. All right. So the city of Wairika uh, has a project that's before the Department of Water Resources currently, which is a planning and engineering grant for improvements to the city's wastewater treatment facility. Uh, so this is a needed upgrade to those facilities uh, that are considered critical pieces of infrastructure within the city. So this would apply, this project applies to the wastewater treatment plant wastewater disposal fields and the lift stations. And so what we've done for you today as part of our grant requirement is prepare a uh, environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA, as I'll refer to it throughout this project. Um, and we have found uh, under our recommendation that we should be approving a negative declaration that this would not have any foreseeable impacts to the environment, but we did go through the process of doing a thorough analysis through CEQA for this project. Uh, we did release this for a 30-day review period to the general public, as well as our responsible agencies, which include those like uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Caltrans, Siskiyou County. We did receive two comment letters from responsible agencies and no public comment letters from members of the general public. Uh, the two responsible agencies that responded which were Caltrans and CDFW, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Two of our favorite types of comments is that they commented that they had no comment, uh, which is great for this project. And so what this project is, is that it would be improvements that are needed to these facilities to upgrade them. These facilities have not been upgraded since their creation in the 70s. And so we are overdue for improvements to them. Some of the more important uh, pieces is uh, demolition of the chlorine contact basin filtration facility, uh, inclusion of a SCADA uh, equipment, which is a supervisory control and data acquisition. So it's basically remote sensing uh, that allows our uh, employees to be able to look at in real time any data coming in and out of that facility for monitoring wastewater quality purposes for our permit. And so we're just kind of entering the 21st century uh, with some of these upgrade pieces. Improvements to the disposal field uh, will include a replacement of the control building, moisture sensors, and control valves throughout that. And then there are some improvements to lift stations, which is just efficiencies throughout the city. This includes some lift stations that are northwest of the interstate. Um, we have a number of them throughout the uh, city limits, as well as the unincorporated area that we service. And so again, uh, we prepared this to meet our obligations under the grant, as well as the Environmental Quality Act, which is a state regulation, um, and find that we should be able to approve a final mitigated negative declaration for communication to the state and filing. Um, and we uh, ask that you open the public hearing tonight to accept any other public comments related to the environmental review of the project. Um, so not necessarily the project description, which is set, but the environmental review that was given to you today um, as well as circulated through the public. Um, and then we're requesting that you adopt uh, the proposed resolution, which approves this document, as well as the mitigation monitoring program under CEQA. All right, thank you so much. All right. Okay, so at this time, um, I will open up the public hearing. So public wanting to comment, come to the podium. All right, I will close the public hearing and come back to the city council for any questions or comments at this time. Councilman Davis. Um, is is this the first reading of this and we have to come back and read it again? Nope, you may, uh, if you so choose, approve the resolution that's in your packet and that will be it. Um, what happens after this for CEQA is that we have the lead agency, which is the city of Wairika, um, you may either approve 
uh, request additional information or you may deny the environmental review. And if you approve it tonight, then we communicate this to the state clearinghouse as well as the county clerk's office. And that starts a statute of limitations on if people would like to legally challenge the document itself. Um, but pretty much after tonight, this is all we need to comply with our grant obligations as well as the state statute. So you do not need to bring it back. Pardon? You do not need to bring it back unless you feel that you need additional information to approve all or right. deny. Thank you very much, Mrs. Casey. No, Council Baker. Yeah. Okay. I don't have any questions either. So, um, so the recommended City Council action before you is to adopt the resolution 20, 2441, the resolution of the City Council of the City of Arica adopting a mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting program for the wastewater treatment plant improvement project. I'll move that we accept uh, 2441. Okay. I have the motion uh, from Councilman Davis. I'll second it then. And a second from Councilman uh, Keg. I'll do roll call. Councilman Keg. Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Baker. Yes. And Mayor Middleton's aye. So the motion passes four to zero. Thank you. Okay. Item number 10, let's do business. This is our community development director again. <laughs> Come back on down. <laughs> this is a digital title adoption of solar permitting software and compliance with Senate Bill 379. You usually have more on your agenda in my defense. <laughs> I was wondering where you were going. I'm all my reading so wrong. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. All right. So we had brought this to you at a previous meeting as a consent agenda item, and we had gotten a couple of questions and needed to confirm some state compliance pieces related to this. Um, so this item is related to seven, uh, Senate Bill 379, which requires cities and counties throughout California to adopt and to basically retain an online permitting system specifically for residential solar projects. And the purpose of this was to basically remove any permitting barriers to uh, allowing people to have residential solar on their residences. Um, this bill does not apply to commercial, um, although it could, uh, or we'll, we'll talk about that later. But the, the basically the purpose of this is to remove the time and permitting barriers to those solar projects. And so the bill does not prevent the city from continuing to process hard copies of permits at all. So we will still accept hard copy permits um, through this, uh, we did need to confirm if this did apply to the city or not. There is some confusing uh, wording within the uh, legislation itself, and the authoring office uh, had a certain intent in the bill, uh, but unfortunately, um, intent is really great and until you have the enforcement agency. And so we did confirm with the enforcement agency which is the California Energy Commission, which is that, again, that implementing body that we are uh, subject to this bill. So if at any point uh, we move forward and we didn't adopt anything to do this or to abide by this, um, that agency could take enforcement action upon the city. They're not going to, but uh, you know that's what it is. So we did uh, confirm with them that we are not exempt. Um, that being said, uh, really what it is, is a online permitting software, which is something that we as internal staff have been talking about investing in as well. We are getting more and more requests to process permits internal or digitally uh, to make it more accessible, especially when we do have contractors, engineers, and architects who are working from out of the area, specifically Southern and Central California. We have had a number of people asking for digital permitting processes to make that easier for them. The other thing too, is when we do have a uh, large scale plan sets, so not just solar, but all different types of plan sets, it can be very costly to ship uh, those plans back and forth between the city and the architect engineer specifically for that one. And so this is something that we've actually been talking about doing as well as a larger program to adopt internally. Uh, so this just actually gets the ball rolling for us. And so staff did take a look at two different softwares that are compliant under this bill that are recommended. So we had Solar App Plus as well as Symbium. And so we did uh, several different types of trainings and introductions into the software. Um, we have not confirmed if the software will communicate with our budgeting software or financing software Springbrook yet. 
Um, Springbrook is a very unique software. And so there may be some uh, hiccups into that kind of um, piece where they speak to each other or don't speak to each other. So we are developing policies to deal with that for the purchasing pieces of this. Um, so we did take a look at all of those and determine that Symbium would be the more user friendly as well as the easier to adopt for staff. Uh, so we, we went through that. In terms of the fiscal impact, the Symbium does have a processing fee of $25 that would be applied to each of the permits. Uh, the city is not obligated to pay any additional maintenance fees, purchasing fees for this. It's basically as the permits come in, they'll tack a $25 fee on top of that for the processing of that. Now, if the city council chooses to not charge the applicant that fee, you may, you may subsidize that by not claiming that in your fee schedule. Um, and so if you move forward with this purchase, we will bring a subsequent resolution forward with the fee schedule for this type of application. The other thing we have to take into account that we did not have guidance on yet, which is there is a state statute that only allows the city to charge a very specific amount for residential solar, because again, we don't want to create a fiscal barrier to people doing that. And so we have not gotten an answer back yet from the Energy Commission if the $25 is in addition to that statutory limit or if it is within that statutory limit. Um, we're basically talking about pennies on the dollar, so it's not a huge deal. It's not going to be a huge cost to the city to do either of those things because we're only allowed to charge so much. Um, so we will bring a, a resolution back at the next meeting uh, related to that fee adoption and clarify what that will be per application um, to do that. And so uh, staff processing time is required to track these permits still. So even if we are doing digital processing, we are obligated to report to the Energy Commission as well as the uh, California Building Commission. And I think solar are exempt from the earthquake reporting, but I have to double check that one for solar um, residential. And so we are still required to track, inspect, and uh, do these. So that's why we don't recommend going to zero because the city would not be recouping any of that money for a private project. Um, but again, we'll bring that fee to you at a future meeting. You can talk about fees if you want. Um, and as I stated before, we are re researching into other permits that can go into this system. That would be at no additional cost to the city. We did confirm that with Symbium. So as we move to digitizing other per permitting processes, we do have the ability to integrate them into the system and we won't have to have multiple different pieces of software that all of our staff are having to learn all the time, which is, we appreciate that. So um, I'll open it up if you have any questions or you wanna take public comment. All right, questions from council. Councilman Baker. <laughs> Thank you so much for this information. Um, I do have a couple of questions um, for you. Um, and this comes from my experience of free software programs to implement state programs that always turned out to be really costly mm -hmm. uh, because it always seemed like something needed to be reconfigured, additional software needed to be purchased. Um, and so um, that's that's where I'm coming from. So mm -hmm. it looks like it's really a good deal. Um, have you looked into the cost three years down the road when you want to add additional um, components to it? So basically how Symbium specifically works, um, I don't have Solar App in front of me because I didn't do as much research into the additional pieces on Solar App because that one is specifically engineered just for solar permitting, where Symbium does a host of other applications. And so according to the Symbium rep and then the contract it's, or the purchasing agreement itself is that basically there's a user processing fee. So like when you go to an ATM and it adds $3.25 to your transaction, that is the only thing they charge. And so for them, their business model relies on us putting more and more permits on there so they can tack that fee on. And so it would not be an additional cost to the city itself. The only thing that we would be obligated to pay is if we ever wanted them to do any training, or we can also purchase a package from them where they set up the digital permitting process themselves. So there's kind of a, a sandbox version where we can go in, we can plug in the forms ourselves and put in the different values and like information we collect in the forms. We can do that just on our own time and that does not cost the city any money. If we would like to hire someone from Symbium to work with us to look at our forms and to enter it 
themselves, there is a cost associated to that. So that option is available if for some reason we lose staff capacity or would like some additional eyes on the efficiencies of those forms, uh-huh. we can do that. Um, but if we do add additional permits to the Symbium, it would not be an additional cost to the city. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to just go over to make sure that I, you know, I'm just kind of curious. I just want to make sure that I understand this. Um, Section 8.4 of the contract talks about payment processing fees, and um, it talks about um, fees charged to the end users. Correct. Is the applicant or the person who's um, submitting um, the application for the permit is that considered the end user? Yes, correct. So they're talking about um, a hundred dollar fee plus a five dollar fee. It can be anywhere up to that in cases where the licensing change, but for this one specifically by law, they cannot charge over twenty five dollars in processing because Symbium and Solar App Plus have uh, contracts with the state themselves to not charge over that. Um, but again, uh, we can, if, if Mr. Andrew can take a look at it uh, again as well. Okay. Thank you. And then how many, um, solar applications do we process? Do you process a uh, year or a month? You know, you, uh, on a given month, um, I, I would do it by year because again, we don't see people building solar in the winter because of the the climate we have here, but on a given year, it's probably the bulk of a lot of our permit issuance. Again, we are statutorily confined to how much we collect for those permits. So we don't really, you know, make any money on that. Um, So for solar permitting, we probably do about 65 per year. And that includes um, upkeep, maintenance, remodel. So replacing old systems with new systems as well as new systems themselves. Now that permit is specific to just solar work. And that doesn't take into effect any commercial or residential permits that include solar and other items. So for example, if someone's redoing their kitchen and getting solar, we typically see them come in and get a residential remodel permit. Now, we are starting to pull those apart per this state requirement. So the SB 379 requires us to now pull that out and and categorize that differently. So we'll have a more accurate number in the next uh, update or so the next reporting would be at the calendar year in February. So we'd have a more accurate number for you. But last year, I believe we did about 60 of just those and not including any remodels or new construction. This is Jason, the city manager. Just want to chime in on that as well, because uh, Juliana and I have been working. Um, nothing irritates me more than when Pacific Power shuts off my power to my house. Okay? <laughs> and so I know Montague dealt with that quite a bit this summer, and we dealt with it. Like I was the first in the first tranche of the 700 residents that um, had our power shut off, and it was relatively warm. And my whole family was out in the front yard pretty much in the evening until it came back on. And so, you know, we're running to try to stand up these resort like uh, CRCs, these locations where people where we have um, generators and in case the power does get shut off and your neighbor who maybe is a little old lady doesn't have air conditioning can come down to the theater or can come down to this space. But also the dream scenario is that Juliana did just bring a grant to me and we're looking at these different grant opportunities where I think we want to subsidize the cost of solar if possible to the community and really drive folks to say, go get solar, go get some battery backup because we're expecting your power to get shut off here more and more often as time goes by. And it would be really nice if we didn't have 7,800 people coming down to, that need service to, <laughs> to hear, you know what I mean? And that ultimately we had people that maybe had, you know, kind of creating your little microgrid in the community where we still had power at locations. Uh, so our goal is to, in the future, subsidize the cost by seeking grant funding to go out and incentivize our local community to low, we would lower that cost for you to get solar. So we're trying to... Um, drive that. So 65, I'd love to see 300 on a, any given year. So I just wanted to put that out there. 
Thank you. By the way, really quick, just to answer your question about uh, Section 8.4 of the contract, the $100 and the $5 is an example. They were using that as an example in the contract. For example, in cases where the licensee charges $100 and there's a $5 credit card processing fee, it would be a total of $105 charged to the end user. So they were just using that amount as an example there. And so for us, it's the $25 would be the credit card processing fee. And that would be the only thing the end user would be charged at this time. Um, but if we did want Symbium to charge our fees for us, which that's the part of the financing budgeting software that we don't quite have worked out yet. So there would no, be no additional charge. So when they go to apply for the residential solar permit now, we'll bring that fee schedule back to you. It would just be the process, the $25 processing fee if that makes sense. So if we choose to do any other permits in the future and we say, oh, we would like Symbium to collect these fees for us and then pay us on the back end, they would be charging additional fees on top of that, which is that $25. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. It does. But yeah, but I do have to say, I did just double check this because I, I hadn't seen the $100 yet because I was like, that doesn't make sense because it says 25 elsewhere. It's just an example of how they would calculate that out. Thank you. And I believe that you said early in your presentation that uh, if the software is implemented, people would applicants still have the option of just coming into the office yes. and filling out. We know where we live. We would still have hard copies. Yes, we are still we are still dealing with a number of individuals who still hand draw plans, which is not allowed under the business and profession code for a lot of permits now. Um, and actually, we should be requiring everyone to bring in stamped plans that are done computer generated because it's easier to look at. Um, we have been a little bit lenient with some of the older individuals who have been doing hand drawings as long as they're legible and that they are drawn to scale. We still accept those, but we should really be going into some of these other more professional means at some point, but we understand that hard copy is really not going to go away for quite a while. So there are no plans to get rid of hard copy if people request it. We do see a huge uptick in digital and it, it is becoming an issue with our office because it's harder to track without a permitting software system. Thank you. Those were the questions, mm -hmm. concerns that I had. Thanks. Thanks. Councilman Kate, just a quick question: Do you, um, who else is using this Symbium uh, software? Is it like Mount Shasta? Anybody else in Siskiyou County, or anybody I've, that you know of that you've been able to connect with to ask how how it's being if it's progressively working? Just to chime in before you answer that question, maybe you can kind of explain. We're the only city in Siskiyou County that's going to be required to do this. Correct. Yeah. We are over so. five thousand population. Oh, that's the population. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but in terms, yeah, compared to other cities other than Siskiyou County. Yeah. So we did get uh, references from both Solar App Plus and Symbium, and we did call those. Um, unfortunately, they're much larger cities than us. Um, because they've adopted Symbium much sooner than this. Symbium just happened to get a state contract to do the SB 379 compliant process, which is a very, very specific process. So City of Irvine was a reference, City of uh, Santa Clarita, and then City of Lancaster were the three references they gave us that we called. Um, and I can't remember the three that were for Solar App mm -hmm. Plus offhand, but they were all much larger jurisdictions. My understanding is the city of Reading, I believe, is doing Solar App Plus. Um, but again, we felt that Symbium has the better, op it's more user-friendly for the people that we have in our office. Um, and then we felt that the addition of other types of permits into the system might actually be a better deal for the city in the long run, you know, as we look to digitizing. So it would be able to app to um, using for other applicant mm -hmm. access. But do they, does Reading use that, theirs? to do that also with them? So Reading has their own internal online permitting system. So they have a much larger IT budget and IT department to do gotcha. that. We do not have that ability at this time. I mean, if you would like to spend money on that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I don't think it would be essentially a great use of our resources to do an internal system. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Councilor Davis? Is there a fee for us to get involved in this, like a buy-in to use no. the Symbium? How, how is that possible? So they charge that user fee. 
So that, that processing fee, that $25 processing fee per application is their business model. And solar app does the same thing. So, so they're, they're paid by, how so are that, they paid? So when, so for example, if you wanted to get a solar residential permit and we had, we go through this process, you would pay $25 on their website. So you, you would go through the process, you'd fill out your permit online, you would pay $25 and then they would process it for you. So the whole point of this is that it's literally a quick turnaround. So you get almost nearly immediate approval of your solar plans, as long as they fit within this software, which is based off of the state building guidelines, if that makes sense. So for example, another um, equivalent to that within the city is the green tags, electrical green tag service. So if you come in right now to city hall the next day and you say, I'm changing out my panel box on my house and I need to get a green tag to do that today, we will issue you a green tag today because the box that you're using is one type of box that's prescribed in the building code as long as it's a certain electrical load. And so you'd come in, you'd say, this is the box, this is the service box that I'm getting from Pacific Power. We basically immediately give you that green tag and we charge you, I believe it's $50 for that green tag because that covers the time of the inspector to go out and inspect. There's really no processing time for us to do that. Where the solar apps do require a level of electrical review and electrical loading review and wiring review. So that's why it's a little bit more expensive to do the solar ones. So basically you would be getting an immediate permit issuance from this software. And that's the purpose of SB 379 is to have this digital software. If you can't blame it on city staff, like taking too long to process it, you purchase, you basically do it, you know, within a very short period of time. So, so it doesn't cost the Us. city of Wairika no. anything for a person to use that lives in the city of Wairika. So they the, use the Symbium Corporation's software. So for the person applying for the permit, they would pay Symbium $25. Yeah, yeah, I got that. Yeah. The city of Wairika would not pay Symbium any money. Zero. All right. Okay. I, I thought there was something I read that said there was a uh, $30,000 buy-in or something. Like that. No. So, no, we do not. Okay. I'm glad. Yeah. It is free for us. Yes. Right. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Any questions from the public? All right. Close public comment or comments in general, and we'll go back to. Sorry, I lost my spot here. <laughs> okay. So um, the recommended city council action before you is the motion to direct the city uh, manager to authorize the adoption of the Symbinium's automatic solar permitting software in compliance with Senate Bill 379. Other wishes of the council? So move. I have a motion from Councilman Kaig. I'll second the motion. We'll do roll call. Councilman uh, Kaig? Aye. Councilman Davis. Aye. Councilman Baker. Yes. And Mayor Middleton, uh, the motion passes four to zero. Thank you. All right. Thank you for all your work on that. Okay. City manager, staff report. City manager and staff may make brief announcements or reports at this time. Mr. Ledbetter. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Wairika City Council, Jason Ledbetter, City Manager. So just a real brief report here. Uh, we had uh, our consultant in town for the SB 1186 Community Center workshop concerning cannabis. So I attended that meeting on 9-11. We are going to have another workshop. It's going to be a virtual only workshop. And so expect to start to see advertisement uh, for that, but ultimately it'll be very similar to if you did come in person, this one is just going to try to hit folks that, uh, maybe can't make an in-person meeting and then, or want to remain anonymous. Cause we're going to have the ability to have, uh, anonymous, um, an anonymous zoom meeting is our understanding from SCI. 
Uh, we had the final comms meeting uh, with direction for an updated website and a proposed $10,000 Cisco Media Council contract that would come in the uh, upcoming budget for you guys to take a look at to approve. And that would be to create these video narratives over our projects that we can then post online, house on our website. Uh, as an example, um, from the comms meeting, I had asked the director of public works to get something posted about the great project that he has been working on with his staff, which is that wastewater collection project. It's kind of snaking all the way around the city and now eventually we'll end up, I believe it is in the minor alleyway. Uh, but it's been all over the city. It started over in the Burgess Street neighborhood. And so ultimately, uh, he did this beautiful posting. It really explained to people everything that had happened and everything that was going to happen in the future, which means they're going to come along and fix the road. But ultimately, you can imagine that same posting, but really more in a video form. And so a 90 second to 120 second video that we can post online as many times as we want, we can add to as uh, the project evolves. Uh, but we can start doing videos for the hypothetical wastewater treatment plan upgrade for the hypothetical. We just got that one and a half million dollar planning grant to bring uh, our water rights back online at, at the uh, reservoir over at Greenhorn. So just getting better communication between what we're doing and getting that out to the public to show them, you know, the bang for their buck as far as uh, what we're up to. Uh, we did tour base camp. Today, I went there um, with uh, our city attorney, uh, Council Member Davis, and then the uh, community development director. Uh, we'll be headed back again, I believe. Uh, we will be going back, Miss Baker, maybe around uh, the 1st of October, if that works for you. Uh, which reminds me, I have a meeting for Rogue Retreat scheduled with uh, Miss Baker, Mr. Davis, Monday. So we'll meet here. And then we'll head up there and we'll get a tour of the urban campground and pallet shelters in Southern Oregon. So that should be pretty interesting. We had a meeting with Pace Engineering, the city's engineering team on 9-3. Uh, it was public work staff, uh, planning staff, and we were discussing kind of the future 10-year plans for state revolving funding grants uh, for water and wastewater. The two biggest projects that we've talked about are really this wastewater treatment plant upgrade, which is currently staring at around 42 to $45 million upgrade. And then the emergency filtration unit multiple water pipe replacement project. Uh, this is what we just got a $1.5 million planning grant for. And this is really a tranche of probably three to four $15 million projects. And this is very exciting. So these numbers are frightening, but we don't pay, we wouldn't pay for any. This is free money from the state of California to do the upgrade. So you won't, you don't actually pay for it on your utility bill. And so we just kind of lined out the next uh, hypothetical 10 years. So that was really exciting. Um, we were told that Caltrans would be digging up the road at this point. That obviously has not happened. Uh, I'll have more news after the Wednesday meeting when Public Works does go to a weekly meeting with Caltrans. What they were doing today, though, in the concrete, they were cutting joints. So they were out there working. Um, and so we do anticipate here this week that they should start to rip up the asphalt and lay down new asphalt. Uh, and then finally, the community development director did just notify me that we have received approval for our permit for the air curtain burner that's over on the public works yard. And that's what we're going to use to start burning people's yard waste. And so we should be rolling something out. That's where our resiliency officer, we got that grant earlier talking about that. Uh, with our fire concerns, uh, Sarah Chaffee will be managing this project, and so it'll be really exciting um, to see what uh, yard waste I can bring down to the yard to burn for free. So, thank you. Mr. Lovegar? Yes. On the curtain, um, how soon do you think that's going to be up and running? So, say fall time when leaves start flying, are we going to, is that something that's going to be up and running at that point in time? I hate to give any um, deadlines as to when we'll be going out there, but the biggest impediment was to get the air, the permit from the air board. So everybody, because of our distance to the high school, everyone at the high school was notified, not for burning, believe it or not, but because we have a 74 horsepower a uh, diesel motor on there and over 70 we have four extra horsepower and so that's the concern is that ultimately if you have a child at the high school that they are going to be around that four extra horsepower of diesel which is still like very very far away from them but it has nothing to do with the burn itself because technically it's supposed to you know in you know quotations here burn clean 
But uh, more information will come out on this. I'll have to see where exactly we stand. But Sarah has been working with Public Works on this project. So I would assume that in the coming months, we would be rolling out. Uh, we're going to try to hit this fall. We are. So I got a lot of things burned. Yeah. Well, and we do have the other option. Uh, and we'll be getting that information out. The community garden takes leaves for free. They have two different weekends that they take them. So we will be getting that information out to folks as well. Thank you. Yep. You didn't hear we're excluded? You don't get to use it? <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah they forgot to tell us i forgot to tell you that <laughs> all right thank you mr ledbetter all right council members who wants to go first no one's ever okay <laughs> council baker thanks thank you you're so always much. right to go so yeah so um not in any particular order. <laughs> I've been busy since I'm back up on my feet. Um, let me see. On August 29th, I believe it was, I virtually attended Congressman Doug LaMalfa's town hall meeting um, that was held in Wairika. Um September 6th, I did tour Project Base Camp with the city manager and uh, specifically to receive a, a status update on an anticipated opening opening date. Um, and of course, everybody's strongly encouraging all the work to be done before November 1st so that they can be open. Um, uh, Mr. Ledbetter uh, did refer to our communications ad hoc uh, meeting that was held on September 10th. And we're looking forward to presenting a report to the council as a whole sometime in October. Um, I attended the public meeting on September 11th regarding uh, medicinal marijuana. And on September 10th, um, I'm a member of LAFCO, which is the local agency formation commission um, and it was actually a, an extremely important meeting because we reviewed the spheres of influence um, for fire departments and fire districts in the county. And the spheres of influence are the areas that uh, the different agencies will respond to. And we actually had some changes to make to the city of Wairika. So Chief Lemus, uh, maybe if you have a couple minutes after the meeting, we could talk about those. Um, and uh, hopefully those uh, spheres of influence will be um, adopted by LAFCO if, at their October meeting. Um, I've been appointed to the Citizen of the Year Committee and look forward to working on that. And uh, then if you haven't heard, the call your rest area is closed indefinitely. And I sit on the uh, C2C committee, which is the call your interpretive information center. And it's um, being closed due to water quality issues of water from the Klamath River that has basically gunked up all the filtration systems and irrigation systems at Collier. Um, so, uh, that beautiful rest stop is closed until further notice. And just to give you an idea of the impact of that, Collier has over 1 million visitors a year. And for the um, Visitor Information Center, um, the figure for just through the end of July this year, we've had 7,900 people go through that um, Visitor Information Center. Um, and that's really important because we have so much information about all of the areas of the county, um, um, tourist information, and um, I'm just really sad. And I'm sad for the people that have lost their residential water um, as well because of the water quality. Um, I won't say anything else about that. Okay, so now on to my request. <laughs> <laughs> um, would it be possible for the council members to receive copies of anything that's posted on our Facebook page or a link to it so that we could take um, a look at it and um, copies of any of the public hearing um, posters that are done um, so that um, we can 
have those in a timely manner. Or just a heads up that, hey, we've added a posting to the Facebook page. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately the clerk is back there listening. Hopefully, uh, Cindy, I see her. And so she does the postings. We discuss them. So I think what we would do ultimately what makes the most sense is we would just screenshot those and email them to you. Perfect. I mean, we're still going to post them. I mean, yeah. Uh, and, and that way, at least you can kind of get, I'm assuming that you're going to get in some phone calls possibly with some of these postings. Um, and then ultimately when we do post back here on the public noticing board, yeah, I don't think that would be a big deal either. We can either put those in your box or we can email them to you if you like. I don't think, um, that's a huge request. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then, um, For the Symbian contract, talked about, um, it was mentioned that um, the fee for that will be brought before the city council for adoption. And I know that the finance committee has actually been discussing updating some fees um, over the past several months as well. So would it be possible if we could get those all together and get all those fees adopted at one time? Yeah, are you advocating to maybe have a finance committee meeting and kind of discuss these fees? Okay, yeah, let's get something on the calendar. And um, we may not bring a final package to you, but I think we should discuss in finance committee what all the fees, because um, yeah. ultimately on an annual basis, based off of the prior year, we should be bringing up the updated fees for what it actually costs the city to get X permit so that we make sure we're utilizing monies that everybody else is pooling for taxes into the parks and into the streets and not into somebody else's building permit ultimately. So yeah, we can do a finance committee meeting. I will let the finance director know. Thank you so much. And then finally, um, several months ago, um, well, not several months ago, three or four months ago, um, after we had um, done a review of the legal counsel's contract, um, I had also suggested that it would be time to do an evaluation for the city manager. So can we get that um, on a future uh, agenda in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want that before the change in council? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I personally would prefer that. Mm -hmm. I know that my experience coming onto the council, one of the first things that we did was an evaluation and, um, I think you're a great guy. <laughs> that was about all I could say yeah. because I hadn't had the opportunity to really work with you. Um, and I still think you're a great guy. <laughs> yeah, we'll get, I'll talk to the HR director. We'll get a meeting probably at our next on the first, maybe we'll get him in close session to discuss what that looks like with you guys so that you guys can get on the same page and make sure that what we did, if you want to continue what was done last time. Um, and then we would just shoot to probably have, uh, we'll get your schedules, but ultimately it always, it's easier to do those meetings with no time limit. So I like to do those where they're not before a meeting. So they would be a standalone special meeting. And so, yeah, that should be no problem. Thank you. And then, um, I do look forward to going on the tour of the rogue retreat and their urban campground on Monday. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilman Bigger. Councilman Davis. Well, that's a hard act to follow right there. <laughs> Good job, <laughs> Tommy, <laughs> Councilman Baker. Um, I sit on the Fire Safe Council, and our last meeting was <clears throat> a Zoom meeting. Pardon me. And not much was discussed except that most of the people were out fighting fire. So um, this, the CAL FIRE was, was a person there involved and uh, the Forest Service was not involved. So it was kind of a short meeting. I think we were over, we started at 6.30. I think we were over about 7, 7.15. So it was good. But mostly what we talked about is where we are and some of the grants that we got going. And that was it. Um, I, too, am excited about going and seeing the pallet shelter, Mr. Ledbetter and Ms. Baker. 
I think that's going to be kind of an interesting thing because we're trying to get into that to that and it's going to be kind of nice to see where where it goes um on my weekly walk in greenhorn park uh we were walking along and down by the um uh, oh the handicapped parking lot in lower greenhorn park there was a dead deer in the water so um I reported it to the police, but I never got anything back from that. But I'm pretty sure they took care of the problem or else the deer sunk one of the two. Public Works uh, removed the deer from the reservoir. They removed it? That's good. Seems how uh, it could be water supply someday. All right. Very good. That's it. That's it. All right. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Councilman Cake. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple of meetings, a uh, COC meeting, continuing of care, Cisco advisory board meeting. That was on September 4th. There was a couple updates. Um, one thing I wanted just to talk about actually was the mobile crisis um, team that they have now. And it's um, basically you can call 988 or you can call the 1-800-842-8979. But it addresses people that are obviously in this in needs of of their help. Obviously, anybody that's going through um, mental health issues or um, homeless issues or anything of that sort. So it was very informative, and they really got a good team that they got started going on there on this mobile crisis team. So that was one thing we hit on. Um, the other thing I had a point in time count today <clears throat> meeting, and that hit on. Um, basically where we're going with on our, that's our January, um, point in time count. And we have a guy that's now running it. Ryan Bonk is his name. And he was, he's actually taken over the point in time committee and running it. So we don't, so I didn't have to do that this year, at least for the, uh, seven counties in the North state. So I guess get to run the meetings. I don't have to actually, um, organize everything. Um, uh, but anyways, what it's, he, we're trying to get all the point in time guidelines situated. So our next meeting, we'll actually have those forms should be well, pretty well done. So I should be able to bring that back and let everybody know and send that out if anybody's interested. Um, that, um, there's just a lot of little di different things on that point in time count that is crucial because a lot of the funding that comes for behavioral health or for anything that we're trying to do comes from those numbers come from point in time count. So it's crucial as of seven years ago, Cisco County wasn't even doing a point in time count. And then we formed a committee and actually got it going. So it's actually crucial that we keep those numbers coming in so we can actually have some type of funding to address those situations. Um, as uh, Ms. Uh, Baker has stated, I'm also on the um, committee to uh, citizen of the year. So I'm looking forward to be involved in that because I was the one that was actually pushing for the citizen of the year again, bringing that back to Wairika because it's very important to me to acknowledge those individuals that have contributed to Wairika and the positive growth of Wairika and uh, businesses and nonprofits and stuff. So there's a lot that we need to recognize those people for all their hard work and what they've done. Um, and uh, let's see what else did I have? Not, I think I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you want me to address the last thing, or if you would like to address the last thing on the way to talk about this, sir. Uh, go right ahead. So I would like take it away. <laughs> take it I'll away. Let you go ahead. So we've had uh, um, discussions, and Mr. Mayor and I that. I would like to see, and I have long with the permission of the council, we'd like to have to basically make a declaration of homeless crisis to lift some of the building restrictions that are going on to make sure that everything is opened up by November 1st is what we would like to see. Other cities have done it. It can be done. And I don't want any um, thing to be drawn in front of us to where there's problems. Right now, we, we're looking at hopefully that the um, base camp will be opened up, which is great. 
but if something does transpire, they already have that facility that's there. Um, another one is the Beacon of Hope. They're actually, um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Milton and I and um, the city manager actually took a tour of Beacon of Hope and they are like 95% done. Only thing they need is a couple of few doors put in um, and they, will, they, they can be up and running also. So by doing this, and like I said, the city of LA declared this and it first got fought, but then it got pushed through and it actually is presented. The actually governor right now is pushing for any cities to lift restrictions on this so he, so we can enforce our city ordinance that we have actually passed and we go in effect on November 1st. He encourages all the cities right now to lift any restrictions on building restrictions to open up shelters to get them going. And that also help with any probably any issues that might come about with the actual pallet shelter too. So I'm I'm asking the council and the mayor to to bring that back at a very quick date and do the what it takes to get that declaration up and going so we can push through the paperwork. That's okay, Mr. Mayor. All right. Uh, so to kind of go with Councilman Kig, as, as the clock is ticking, I'm getting a little concerned that we're mid-September and a lot of the places are delayed um, as far as opening. So I know they're close. And so I would like to explore as uh, what Councilman Kig is uh, discussing is how can we get there to, if there's something we need to ease up on so they can get to the finish line to put off some of the improvements or delay or how we can get around where we can get these facilities open while they still work on things, you know, to get them open. Cause I'm really concerned we're getting almost, you know, 40 days away and they're hoping to get open. So we're, we're getting kind of concerned on how we can look at it as a bigger picture as a council and how we can get there working with um, the attorney and working with um, Mr. Ledbetter on how we can make this work because we're the time is ticking. And as we hoped when we sat here to do the um, ordinance that we extended it out and that was um, Ms. Baker, we're all in agreement because we're like thinking, okay, this is going to give them time. And now we're here at the end of September and it's not looking good on some of them to get open for our unhoused population. So um, due to weather, I sorry, yeah, I oh, go ahead. There. So yeah, that's but where we're due to weather. I think that we were getting concerned critical. about some of these places not getting there. So to maybe get there with some of the, the homeless yeah. emergency, we could declare, hopefully get something done. This would lift the burden off the city too, if, if we need you know, on the warming center type situation too, that we've had that uh, had to address in the in the past that it could help us lift those and get those buildings up and going to where they can house these individuals. You know, we need to we need to get these individuals off the streets. Um, just a quick mm -hmm. little story this weekend, just so everybody knows, mm -hmm. I had a personal battle myself, or not myself, but my mother did. Um, of course, everybody knows where I live, that mm -hmm. we actually had a homeless individual uh, break into my mom's mm -hmm. side room and camp out for two days, two individual nights. And we got him on video, but we don't have him on video to where we see him going in and out of the, out of the building. We know who it is. We know this person uh, has this issue going on. Um, but what I'm getting at is this is going to be more prevalent unless we open up to get some more stuff opened up. And it impacts everybody, not just obviously me. It impacted my mom, who is has major heart condition going on right now that we need to keep her calm as possible. But anyways, I'm used to dealing with this sort of thing, but not most people are used to dealing with these sort of situations. So we need to get these individuals off the streets 
as soon as possible, just for the safety, uh, not only of them, but for the safety of the citizens. And this can be done. We as a city have lifted um, building restrictions mm -hmm. before, right, wrong, or indifferent, but it can be done. And to make sure for the safety of not only the unhoused individuals, but the safety of our citizens too. So like I said, other cities have done it. It can be done. I just need, like I said, we need the mm -hmm. uh, to move forward on it. And I need this the uh, council mm -hmm. to, to want that to move forward. And I know the mayor wants to move forward on that. So I would like that brought back as soon as possible. Mr. Ben, as a point of clarification, yes. this is the declaration of homeless crisis that you talked about. This is similar to what Karen Bass did for City of LA. Correct. Yes. I, was that right? Yeah, I think that's what. That's what you would like brought back. Correct. And if and um, um, if the mayor is oh, so willing that um, we can work with our attorney on that and bring it back, if it's okay with the mayor. Okay, I guess the question is that we uh, do we give direction to work on it or do we bring it back for an emergency meeting, um, Mister uh, Jared? Drew Blank. Huh? <laughs> so it would be a special meeting, not an okay. emergency special meeting. meeting. Okay. Special um, meeting. And um, you can do either the next council meeting or do a special council meeting uh, with the next week. Okay. What are the what are your thoughts with um, Councilman Baker and Councilman Davis? We're already at when's our next meeting? I'm sorry. Oh, jeez, that's soon. That's see, I'm getting concerned that that November first is creeping up on us, and if. Hopefully they'll be open, but just maybe we can have a planned discussion if there's some reason if they're going to need a help to get open. If there's a possible path to that, we can have a discussion about that. Are, are you talking about uh, something that once we adopt it, it passes immediately, like a resolution or something that affects? A certain amount of time. Yeah, that type of declaration um, would probably be by a resolution um, okay. or a proclamation or a declaration. Um, there are there are a couple of ways that it would be tailored to this scenario. Um, what the mayor did in Los Angeles was actually a declaration did not take council action. It was done as a um, uh, basically an emergency. Mm -hmm creating the um, emergency operations center um, and opening up a effectively a, a, a local disaster type approach. Um, I have not researched it to look at what effect it would have on building codes. Um, I, I don't think that it would affect life safety, building code issues. Um, I what it what I do know about it is that freed up funds um, with the city of LA and uh, the purchasing ordinances associated with the city of LA in order to address uh, homeless um, issues. Um, so I think what's being asked is a little specific towards um, allowing for shelters to be open. Um, and so we'd have to to look at um, how that could be achieved. But to answer your question, yes, it would be immediately. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see a special meeting. Okay. Okay. And to be and to be clear, because I'm getting looks, to be clear, the mayor in Los Angeles is a stronger mayor where she gets to make those decisions without counsel and, and there's no backlash. She gets to come in and say to Jason or the city attorney, under my authority you're doing this i do not get to do that so just so we're clear yes. that their mayor in a big cities are different from the mayor sitting in this seat yeah under the the emergency <laughs> um the emergency uh on certain things yeah that is present in the city of la it's yes. different than the kind yeah. of um civil defense style emergency <laughs> uh, powers that you have here in Wairika. 
Yeah. I just don't want to get out there saying, yeah, that mayor did that. Why isn't this mayor doing this? Because I've seen it before, heard it saying, oh, he should be doing this. He should be directed the council. They should be more with the unhoused or homeless. He could be doing this. He hasn't done his job. That's not my position as a mayor in this town, as it is like Mrs. Bass, who makes way more than I do sitting, <laughs> way more than I do. So I just want to make that clear. <laughs> mayor something that's voted on so that gives the mayor more yeah, right. um, exactly individual powers as well as uh general fund city or uh, yeah. general uh general organized right. yeah right um, city versus a charter system right. city which i believe la is a charter LA is a charter city with a strong mayor um, and has a, a different emergency uh, services situation. And um, it's my understanding that um, Mayor Bass did this, or was trying to do it two plus years ago. It was then a campaign promise uh, for, and, and then was done on her first day of being reelected last April, May, whenever that was. And um, I don't know to what effect it's at. I, all I read up is is that there was a litigation and she did win the litigation in the city of LA against the the parties that brought and she did win to move forward with what she had. So um so meeting, let's look at our calendars. Yes, thank you. That's what I was just gonna ask what works for the four of you. What works for everybody next week? You said next week. I, I'm not in favor of that. I, I think we can handle it on the first. That's okay. my opinion. I'd rather get it done as soon as possible. I'm in agreement with Ms. Baker to get it done before the uh, 1st of October because our time is ticking on this issue. Yeah, I okay. agree. I think we're going to run, if, if there is any glitches with the base camp, I feel that we might be set back too far and we'd be behind okay. again. So. so our majority goes to um, having it next week. So what does their base calendars look like on that? This is next week. I'm good because I can't this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I I think I'm open. I'm open. Council Baker. Yeah. Okay. Andrew, what's or do you have any? <laughs> I'll say I yeah I'm unavailable Monday the twenty third, uh the twenty fourth um. Oh, that'd be my first day back in the office after the weekend. I, I uh, pulled out, out of the Thursday. office on, so um, I would recommend six, the twenty sixth, twenty fifth, twenty sixth. It's Thursday, twenty sixth. It's a Thursday. Twenty sixth would probably be the best. Thursday, twenty sixth. Okay. Evening time, better for you. Regular time, six thirty. It's fine with me. Yeah, as long as it's fine with the rest of council. Six. Can we do it a little earlier? We can. Five? Five thirty. We can. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Five thirty the twenty sixth. Five thirty the twenty sixth. Yep. Okay. I'll send the calendar invite out tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Okay. Was that everything on your on your list? Or do you yeah. have a little more? Or do you have a little more? Are you anything to go? I don't want to add anything okay. to the list anymore. Okay, I, I've added enough for everybody. Okay, and I'll be real, real quick. Um, let's see. You already talked about we did tour the um, it's called Hope House now, right? What? It's Hope House now, right? Not Beacon of Hope. It's called Hope House. Yes, yes, you're correct. Um, Hope House. Yeah, if you want to elaborate a little yeah. bit more on that. Um, I was surprised as if I don't know if you've been by Foothill, look at the property they're putting the pallet shelter. You look at the Hope House and it, you know, the parking lot's kind of weeded and the building kind of looks plain, but you go inside. Wow, what amazing facility they have built. It is really nice inside. It's way more than I anticipated. I thought I walk in and they have a lot to do. No, it's it's probably what 90% finished inside. Yeah, what do you guys think? It's got doors. 80%? It's got something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, mm -hmm. it's further along than I thought. Um 
and um, so anything that could provide services. So we had a great discussion um, on that property as well as um, everything else. Uh, let's see here. Um, I received over the last week um, several complaints about um, RVs and trailers starting to accumulate. And I just want to say thank you because I received tons of calls. And so I had to get with Jason. He got with Mark and YPD was on it. And they're, I'm happy to report. And I'm sure you guys are happy that they are moved and out of there within just a few days. So I had a lot of people saying thank you that they were gone because my phone was ringing off the hook and getting texts and calls and pictures. And and I was aware they're there, but they were in contact with me and they are gone. So thank you for working hard to get those gone. Uh, to um, Chief and his staff. So I uh, really appreciate that because it was not looking good. Um, let's see, what else? Um, even though not Wairika, like it supports Wairika, you know, with um, the balloon uh, pilots and everybody staying in town this coming weekend, it um, provides tax revenue for us from restaurants, the hotels, just bringing everybody out to the area and to Eureka. So make sure you support the balloon fair. It's always a great event. Um, I was invited uh, to on September 28th, which is a great event. That is, this is their second year downtown will be the um, beef and brew. They invited me to be, <laughs> be a judge for their appetite, appetite, the appetizers. So I'll be a judge at the, um, at that event. So that's a good one to go and get tickets because I guess they don't have very many uh, left. So I know they sell out the door, but I think they're um, going fast. So make it's sure you- It's a good to be a judge on, man. I know. Uh, so yeah, I guess there's only 12. I speak to someone, they went to one of the other ones and they had over a hundred. I said, oh my gosh, you'd be so full by the time you remember what you're tasting. <laughs> so I'm glad there's only 12. And uh, so go support that event downtown. Any events we have downtown, we brought brought back um, quite a few great events back to Wairika this summer and fall. And um, so really um, happy that people are enjoying all those events downtown and supporting our local merchants and getting out and about. So with that, I will um, wrap up the meeting and thank everybody for coming and Meetings adjourned. Have a great evening.